So thanks again for doing this. The point uh, of the, or the thrust of the interview is early education and uh, youth services like after school care, um, summer programming, that sort of thing. So I want to start kind of big picture. Um, there's a lot of attention now at the federal level on early education issues and affordability. And so I'd love to ask you, with all of the additional federal attention and resources that are being steered this area, how would you prioritize that money? Where would you, for example, build out additional capacity versus strengthening what we have? So uh, in terms of a focus on, on early education, Christina, I think the first thing I would say is we need to make sure at this New Deal moment where there is, as you said, uh, a once in a lifetime potential investment in children and families, that we have a mayor at City Hall who has the relationships, the knowledge to be able to work incredibly closely with uh, not just the Biden-Harris administration, but also with all of our leaders in Congress to be able to make sure that New York gets a fair share of that, of that funding. And you, you, I'm sure you know, New York sends $23 billion more to Washington each year than we get back in return. And I really, as a, as a former cabinet secretary for President Obama, as a former budget director uh, leading the $4 trillion budget, I, I have unique ability as a mayor to make sure that we get our fair share of that investment to transform the opportunities and the lives of children and families in this city. Um, and what I would say is, it is absolutely right that we need to keep building on the progress that we've made on early childhood education. And that means getting not just the universal pre-K, but universal 3K um, with that investment. But there are also significant areas where we need to do better than we're currently doing. And, and one area that I would really point to is that we very much have a focus um, and uh, investment that is different depending on whether those are school-based pre-K and 3K or that they're community and family-based. And we know that, for example, um, the payment to the teachers in those settings, the benefits, the, uh, the workspaces and the classrooms themselves are quite different across those different groups. And so we really need to make sure that every seat in, in pre-K and 3K is a quality seat. And I would significantly increase the investment, particularly in our family-based and community-based centers to bring them up to the level of the school-based centers so that there's real equity there and that we're investing. Because right now we see so often, and you know this, you know, uh, folks that are trained at family or, or uh, community-based centers who end up leaving very quickly. And it's very hard to make the investments, the training, the other things to build the quality workforce that we need unless we're doing more there. So there's clearly an expansion that needs to be happen, particularly on, on 3K, but there also needs to be a much better uh, equity and investment to make sure that every uh, opportunity for early learning is uh, a quality opportunity. Um, and, and if we do that, we can fundamentally change the trajectory of children in this, uh, in this city. Right now, the single greatest predictor of a child's life chances, even their life expectancy, is the zip code they grow up in. And that's fundamentally wrong. We cannot have a city where your zip code determines your future. And so my 15-minute neighborhood plan is focused on every single element that would give every child a head start and ensure that they're really building the opportunity that they that they need. And that's something that um, I would ensure we have centers in every single neighborhood. So I want to zero in on, um, you know, you mentioned zip code being determinant of the outcomes. Mm -hmm. Um, so the city has really made strides making pre-K and affordable uh, child care option. Sorry, the city has made straight has made strides making pre-K more available, but infant toddler care options can be really hard to come by and really expensive. There is a backlog of families who are waiting to receive vouchers to help pay for care, even while seats at centers go empty. I would love to hear your understanding of where you think the problem lies there, what's causing it, and how would you fix it? 
Well, first of all, and we've seen this again and again, that the difference between rhetoric and reality under Mayor de Blasio uh, has been wide. And again, to give him credit for getting to the huge expansion in pre-K that we did uh, is great. But we see in so many different areas, this is just one of them, where there are promises made around getting resources to families and the reality of that, the actual management and competence in delivering that is uh, a huge problem. And I think fundamentally what we see so often is a lack of real outreach into communities, into neighborhoods. As somebody who started working 30 years ago um, with nonprofits around this city, I know that community-based organizations, not just in education and childcare, but also in housing, in social services, can be the best partners to reach families and make sure that we are signing them up quickly, overcoming language and trust barriers that often stand in the way of families even applying in the first place to make sure that we have a robust pipeline uh, of applicants and that we can use the resources that we have. And of course, we have to go beyond that. And, and that's why I go back to, this is a New Deal moment. We have an opportunity with a, a huge investment in human infrastructure, not just physical infrastructure, but um, rightly, President Biden, Vice President Harris want to make a huge investment in the infrastructure of our families, of our children. And this is an opportunity not just to make sure that every voucher we currently have is going used, but to dramatically expand the opportunity for childcare um, and early learning across this entire city. And I would make sure one of the things we need to do is make sure that those immigrants and those who are undocumented to have that chance as well. So one of the things that the Biden plan calls for or pays attention to is pay in the early childhood workforce. And you've already sort of hinted at this. There have been strides in New York City towards more pay parity, but for people who have been working in CBOs for a long time and for teachers in special education pre-K centers, um, there's still a long way to go. And so I'd love to hear for, from you what is your plan for uh, salary parity? And do you have a timeline in which you'd like to see that accomplished? Well, I think uh, absolutely I have uh, a clear plan on that. And, and I would say more broadly, Christina, the New York Times, the Gotham Gazette have said that I have the most detailed comprehensive education plan of any of the candidates in the race. Um, we are running the campaign of ideas and we've really laid out, I think, the most comprehensive agenda to get to uh, pay parity, ensuring that every seat in uh, pre-K, 3K, uh, every opportunity we have for uh, childcare is, uh, we not just have the quantity we need, we have the quality that our children and our families deserve. And pay equity and equity in benefits, equity in, in opportunities is an enormous part of doing that. So I believe that this is something that we could get done in my first term, particularly with the deep relationships and ability I have to tap into federal investments on this side. But to do it, I think we're, it's not just gonna take the resources, it's gonna take the partnerships as well. What you often find is, and you know this well, is many of these centers are small. They don't have the technical expertise necessarily to fill out uh, grant writing and, and paperwork. We need to reduce the red tape. And one of the things that we can really do is create um, and grow the nonprofit intermediary organizations that help these centers um, survive and thrive. So to be very specific, the bookkeeping, the uh, applying for assistance, the payroll and accounting, all of those things need to be things that we help many of these centers with so that they can focus on our kids. And so not just investing quickly in the pay and the benefits themselves and getting to that parity, but ensuring that we're creating a, an infrastructure to help those centers survive and thrive is, is a critical part of my plan as well. Yeah, I know your plan talks about breaking down the silos in that area. I want to ask you about um, 
extended day, extended school year slots. Many working families uh, with young kids rely on programs that provide care for a longer period of time than the traditional UPK um, and also for the entire school year. Uh, you know, otherwise they're left without caring um, that more of these slots are needed, the extended school day, extended school year. So do you think there should be ex uh, universal access to extended school day and school year slots? And if so, when might we expect to see that under your administration? So it, it is absolutely the right goal, Christina, to try to get to full day, full year opportunities for every student. Um, we know this is a fundamental difference. Um, and we've seen this past year the, the profound differences for frontline essential workers who have to be on the job in person, who, who have full days, so many families working two, three, four jobs to try to make ends meet. This is a central part of equity in our city is, is to make sure that every family and every child has the opportunities for their kids to learn. And, and frankly, not to get drawn into uh, crime and violence and other activities that so often happen uh, outside of school hours when uh, young children and, and later older children don't have the opportunities that they need. So this is absolutely central. To, to make an exact commitment on how quickly we could get to universal, I think we need to see what happens with uh, the jobs bill. Uh, as you know, 2.3 trillion has been proposed um, and whether we can get close to that, whether the critical pieces of investment in human infrastructure, as I've said, and social infrastructure are fully funded is gonna be critical to determine whether uh, we can get to this uh, full universal um, access to those extended hours and, and summer um, through the, uh, my, it, within my first term, but it is absolutely something that I'm committed to getting to. What I would also say is this isn't something that's just important for uh, our early learners, our younger children. This is something that I'm very much committed to throughout school. I I'm the one candidate who's made a commitment that every single uh, high schooler should have at least one paid internship, uh, apprenticeship, summer job before they graduate. That I would get to that in my first term. Um, and we need to make sure that those kind of opportunities are available at, at every age um, and that they're critical. I would also just say, having released the most comprehensive food plan of any of the candidates in the race, I also know that summer meals are a critical part of the infrastructure that schools provide uh, as well. And that's something as we focus on summer that we have to ensure is part of the plan as well. So you mentioned jobs for high schoolers. I want to touch on youth services. Um, so after school and summer programming are really important for working families um, and provide supports such as food security, mental health supports, that sort of thing. Uh, but many of the providers who, who provide these services in the city say that they're trapped every year in a budget dance where they have to uh, advocate every year to get the money reallocated. And so are there programs, youth programs, that you think deserve uh, more stable long-term funding? And if so, which ones would you want to see a longer-term commitment to? Well, I, I absolutely believe there are many youth programs that deserve uh, bigger and more stable funding, and I'm absolutely committed to that. Part of this, Christina, is we don't treat nonprofits in this city like the critical partners that they are. I, I started working with a nonprofit in my first job out of school 25 years ago, uh, a nonprofit that was rebuilding the South Bronx and Central Brooklyn, so many of the neighborhoods that I had seen crumbling, even burning as a child. And so my perspective is that those are the critical partner partners to translate promises into reality, real change in the lives of, of children and families. And yet we don't pay them uh, effectively. We don't pay them quickly. In fact, during this crisis, when they were most needed, we stopped paying so many of them. And we pay them in a way that we expect. It's as if 
the good feelings that they get from helping our children and families should be enough rather than really compensating them in ways that allow them to pay their employees well, to build working capital, to invest in becoming the institutions that we, that we need. So for me, it's not just expanding the funding that's available for programs, but actually treating nonprofits as the incredibly important partners that they are and starting to do, to do justice on that, on that side as well. And I think that's a critical uh, a part of making sure we have the full uh, human infrastructure we need for uh, those kind of uh, programs for young people late in the day, in the summer, uh, those are all critically important. I'm also especially excited about the programs that start early exposure um, to potential jobs. We really have to build a cradle to career pipeline for our children. And so, for example, um, on my Fiber of Food tour, I visited in Snug Harbor in Staten Island, uh, the largest working farm in the city that engages children starting at a very young age in understanding how things grow, how to eat healthy food, and but also exposes them potentially to an interest that might lead to uh, uh, careers in the future that are really powerful. And those kind of connections I would make to my Youth Climate Corps, for example, that I, I, I've proposed as part of my climate plan. There are many, many areas where we can be doing that early, early on and really getting children connected to the food they eat and to potential future careers. I wanna zoom out a bit. So um, we're not gonna have a new mayor when the new school year starts, but I would love to hear from you how you think the city or what the city should be doing right now to build trust with families so that they actually return to classrooms. Um, we've seen a huge drop off in pre-K enrollment in the city during the pandemic. We've also seen that Black families, Asian families um, are far less likely to be in buildings um, than white families. And so if, if you were mayor, what would you want uh, the city to be doing and saying right now to have those folks come back? Well, Christina, unfortunately, we're having this conversation now when we shouldn't even have needed to have it. If, if we'd had a mayor who led in the right way, we could have gotten schools open last September and we could have done it most importantly in a way that really emphasized and focused on uh, the children who were most likely to be left behind. Uh, and, and to be clear about that, if we'd really responded to what our principals, our educators, our, our parents were saying, we would have been able to get the ventilation right in our schools. We would have been able to use our communities as classrooms, whether it was outdoors, whether it was our libraries, our YMCAs, our gyms, others that were not in use and could have become part of the learning experience given that we would have had to reopen um, with far fewer children uh, per room, per classroom. And so that was a huge missed opportunity. And in particular, if we'd done it, knowing that there were gonna be certain families, as you said, um, uh, our students of color, our families of color, uh, second language learners, so many others who would be more resistant, who were not getting the vaccines and the testing that they needed, we could have actually focused on those families and used this moment. President Obama used to say to us, we cannot let a crisis go to waste. This could have been a moment actually to close the inequities in, in our school system rather than have them widen even further. And that would have required as well a deep investment in devices and getting to affordable broadband. For so many families, the issue isn't having devices. It's that their service isn't fast enough, especially when you've got two parents and a, a whole bunch of kids at home trying to use the same network. And so this was a huge issue that we should have focused on and needs to be a focus right now. We do need to give families choices and we need to make sure that their children can learn remotely if that's the choice that they made. But we also need to be doing everything we can to build trust around vaccines and testing so that our young people and our families feel, feel safe in doing that. And that's why I have a most aggressive plan on mobile uh, vaccination teams, opening uh, vaccination sites in 
public housing, community rooms, in libraries, in places around the city that are fundamental to, to getting to those. And then deep partnerships with nonprofit groups and others so that we can get to families in their languages, because often the message doesn't matter if it's not through a trusted messenger. And so we need to partner with those trusted messengers. The last thing I would just say is I would set the tone immediately as mayor with my chancellor. Um, I would ensure that um, we were out meeting with parents and families immediately. I would do a five borough listening tour as one of the very first things that I would do as, as mayor to start rebuilding that trust given how much it's been broken. Um, I wanna ask one more question and then open it up for you in case there's anything that we haven't touched on that you think is really important to include. Um, so there's a lot of attention paid to segregation in the K-12 system in New York City, but pre-K classrooms are actually more segregated than kindergarten classrooms. Uh, but this often gets left out of the conversation in New York City. And so do you have any um, ideas for how and where uh, the city can start addressing racial and economic segregation in its pre-K classrooms? So I absolutely have ideas. Uh, I would say the, the biggest, boldest ideas about how we address segregation starting at a very early age. And first of all, it begins with the fact that we're never gonna truly solve segregation and inequality unless we focus on our housing um, because the racial segregation uh, in our neighborhoods is a root cause of the segregation that starts at an early age. And that's why I led as housing secretary for President Obama, uh, the real giving it for the first time really since the Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968, real meaning to uh, what the Fair Housing Act intended to do, which is actively promote integration and more equity in our neighborhoods. This is why, Christina, when Donald Trump still had a Twitter account, he was attacking my work last year with the racist uh, statement that we were trying to destroy the suburbs by ensuring that black and brown people could live wherever they choose in our city and our country. And I would, as mayor, make absolutely make sure that every New Yorker can live wherever they choose. And so that's a root cause, particularly at the earliest ages, because as you know, neighborhood-based childcare and uh, early learning opportunities are critical for, fa for uh, uh, families across this city. So that, that's one root uh, issue that we need to attack and nobody would attack it uh, in, a, in a more aggressive way than, than I would. Second, what I would say is, especially as we move toward uh, better equalization of centers that family and neighborhood-based um, uh, centers uh, are improved in quality, in pay, in benefits, that's gonna have a disproportionately positive impact on uh, families of color to make sure that we have uh, better opportunities. Um, I also think starting at a very young age, we need to be thinking about uh, changing the way we, we screen kids. Um, I believe testing at four years old for gifted and talented, all the, the uh, evidence is that it is not effective way. And so as we're building out more opportunities for quality early learning in uh, black and brown neighborhoods across this city through my 15 minute neighborhood proposal, at the same time, we have to make sure that we're building a system that gives access to our youngest learners uh, to all the special opportunities that our current gifted and talented program provides and building out more seats um, in, those, in those neighborhoods as well. Lastly, I would just say that it's gonna be critically important that we ensure um, at our youngest ages that we're making investments in things we know work um, for reading and, and, and others, particularly for uh, students with disabilities. What we know is that the early, earliest screening um, that directs children into those programs, into IEPs, has real discriminatory elements. And we've got to take a hard look at that to ensure that we're not tracking black and brown kids into uh, directions in school at an early age that are going to fundamentally change their chance at opportunity. And this is something, I, I, I'm the only candidate who's pr proposed creating 
a chief equity officer reporting directly to me as mayor that would have purview all of over to education and every other uh, agency in the city. And that's going to be critically important to make sure that we're measuring in every single one of these areas what the different impacts are for communities of color in New York and ensure that we're making changes continuously to ensure equity uh, in every area. Is there anything that we haven't touched on in terms of early ed, child care, uh, after school programming, summer programming that you want to um, include in this interview? Yeah, so just just building on on what we've talked about, I would say two two more things. One is really on equity more broadly. This is in, in early learning, but throughout the system, building on my chief equity officer, making sure that we create a, a publicly available equity report card um, for the entire city for every school district that would really allow parents and families to know the truth and to hold our school system uh, accountable. That's gonna be a critical piece. Um, and establishing a diversity and integration office uh, within the Department of Education that really coordinates all these efforts. Those are pieces that I think really go to this issue uh, uh, of equity that I know you've been so focused on uh, and Chalkbeat's been so focused on. That's gonna be critically important. The last thing I would just say though, too, is you know, stepping back, we have to understand that this has been a year of trauma, uh, of pain, uh, of loss, like no other for our, our children and our families. And, and as, a, as a lifelong New Yorker who grew up in the 70s and 80s, who was moved to enter public service because of the terrible crisis of homelessness, of abandonment of neighborhoods, uh, that I saw around me, having lived through and led through 9-11 and Sandy and the mortgage crisis, crisis after crisis in the city, none of those, I believe, has done as much damage, has created as much trauma, pain, and loss for, for our children and our families as this past year has. And so starting at the very earliest stages, we need to make sure that as we're getting our city back, we are making sure that we're not just getting children and families back into the classrooms, back into early learning centers. We have to really focus on that trauma. And so for me, in addition to adding 150 social workers to our school system, and also making sure that we're really uh, creating, I think one of the most innovative proposals in my education plan, the Education Recovery Corps, I would put young people to work, CUNY students, recent graduates, hopefully the teachers of the future in our city um, that will increase diversity in our, in our classrooms uh, and, and increase our, the diversity of our teaching core, that we're putting those education recovery uh, core to work, not just to accelerate academic recovery, but to really focus on the social and emotional needs of our children. And as you know, for our young children, that may not be verbal. It's gonna take real training to understand through uh, whether it's drawing uh, or other kinds of innovative channels, uh, arts and dance and movement, helping our youngest children really deal with the trauma, the pain and the loss that they've been through. Um, you know, my wife's a landscape architect and one of the very first projects she ever worked on was a therapeutic garden to help young children who've been through trauma who couldn't verbalize it. There are really innovative ways that we could begin to partner with our early learning centers to deal with this trauma and loss to ensure that our children recover, not just academically, but emotionally as well. And unless we do justice to the pain and the loss that our children have, have gone through and our families have gone through, we're never gonna allow them to really fully heal from this year uh, that we've all been through. 